Okay, so yeah, we, we are very happy to have a Bao Ping here. Professor Bao Ping Liu is coming from, uh, you can see Peking University. As actually, he, uh, he is also coming from the Peking International uh, Center for Mathematical Research. And uh, he graduated from Peking University and got his PhD in UC Berkeley. And then he moved to the University of Chicago with uh, work and the work with uh, uh, Professor Koenig, right? And uh, uh, Schlag. Professor Schlag and Koenig. Both Koenig. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. great, great. He studied uh, nonlinear um, PDE from fluid and uh, mathematical physics. It's a very good uh, active field. And today he will talk about the uh, uh, KDV equations. And the title is the well postness of the KD uh, of the KDV uh, hierarchy. That's a welcome. Okay. So first, I would like to thank uh, uh, Weijin and uh, all the organizers for the <clears throat> invitation. Uh, this is uh, something that I'm working with uh, Professor Herbert Koch from uh, University of Bonn and uh, um, Friedrich Klaus from the University of Caswell. And so it's uh, still not online yet, but uh, we are probably finishing soon. So my talk uh, will be about the KDV hierarchy. And uh, so for that, I will start with the, the classical model, which is uh, KDV equation. And this is one simple equation. It's real valued and it's one dimensional. Uh, it's one of the simplest nonlinear equation that you can think of, uh, but it has um, important role in the history. In particular, the KDV models the propagation of shallow water waves along a canal. And um, it becomes important because uh, of this um, very nice story that we all know. Uh, so in 1834, um, Scott, uh, uh, Scott Russell discovered uh, this uh, solitary waves uh, and uh, he was uh, doing a lot of experiment and uh, he reported this uh, to the community, but there was a long debate uh, when many of the big guys like Stocks and others, they don't believe such type of uh, uh, solitary waves uh, exist because um, they think uh, the wave has to decay at some point. Uh, but uh, about 60 years later, uh, Kotwich and his student Deverus, they come up with this equation. Uh, and for this equation, uh, they were able to find uh, explicit solutions that uh, <clears throat> is traveling wave solutions. And hence they confirmed uh, Russell's observation. And um, so um, KDV equation has a lot of uh, features that make it even simple, but uh, important model from this different perspectives. Uh, one of it is to look at it as the dispersive equation. So this is one of the typical model, which means that when you look at the linear part of the equation uh, for this one, it's area equation. And if you consider the plane waves, you will see that uh, different velocity so which means different uh, frequency, different frequency will travel at a different speed. Uh, hence, uh, if you take um, a localized data and then at a later time, it will uh, different, they will, they will spread out. So um, the, linear, the linear solution will disperse. Uh, this can be characterized by two facts. One is conservation of the L2 norm and second is what was, uh, is the decay, the L infinity decay uh, estimate. Uh, so an another feature of it, it is the derivative semilinear equation. So in the sense that the nonlinearity is u u x. So uh, even simple it is, but it makes the um, uh, regularity problem very difficult uh, to see because if you just use energy method, you put the solution in any HS space, then when you estimate nonlinearity, you would need HS plus one. You would need the HS plus one. So this tells you that the classical energy method fails. And the key to low regularity theory is to understand, in fact, not only low regularity, so even to use, uh, even for high regularity, classical energy messages fills at any regularity. So, but the key is to use some sort of local smoothing estimate, which says that a local in time, the solution will gain one more derivative 
uh, better than the data. So these are the two features that you see just as a, a standard equation, but they, but they, they, these properties generalize to different uh, uh, models, uh, for example, the linear Schrodinger equation and other types. But then there's another feature of KDV equation, which, which is important is that it's integrable equation. So how do we understand the integrability? We think of it in the following sense. This is the, uh, so, so I think there are a lot of way to explain integrability, but the common one that is uh, people use in the literature is to see that there exists a lex pair. So in particular, if you will say that this operator L is the second order different operator and P is the third order different operator. So now uh, U is an unknown function uh, depending on time. Okay. So naively, the, op the commutator of L and P uh, will, um, will be an operator, will also be a differential operator. But uh, for this uh, two, when you commute, it is actually a op different operator of order zero. So it's a multiplicative operator and uh, of, of order zero. And then, so uh, the equivalence is that if you solve the KDV equation, if and only if, uh, the uh, L derivative is equal to P and L. So this is uh, what we call the existence of lex operator. And in particular, if you think of about UT is a Schwartz solution to the KDV equation, and then the P will generate, uh, the P will generate a, a, a unitary operator, U, UT. It will generate a unitary operator. And then, so we will easily find that LT is L0 conjugated by UT. So this is one of the key feature uh, of lex operator. It tells you that the spectral properties of L is preserved by the flow, right? If it's just a matrix, it tells you that L0, the eigenvalues of LT and L0 are the same. So this tells you that at any time T, the spectral information should be the same. And we will, we will come back to this because this is um, uh, important for us. Okay, and then um, uh, another common feature of integral system is there, there are infinite many conserved quantities. So for example, for KDV, you can see the first one uh, is just a, a basic the integration of U. Second one is mass. The third one is the Hamiltonian. Uh, also you can call it energy. And then you have uh, more uh, conserved quantities involve higher other derivatives of you. Okay, so what we are interested in is the low regularity problem. <clears throat> and uh, in some sense, uh, so we describe it as follows. So what is the optimal range of S uh, such that the initial data U0 in HS is uh, local or globally well posed? So um, uh, we, we are just looking at the problem for uh, for it on a line, but you can also ask it on the torus, which means you can also consider the periodic case, which you will see uh, uh, there are also results related. So, um, so even uh, for just this, uh, the classical KDV equation, there are a lot of works uh, involved in, um, I think, the past uh, 30 years, and each of them will uh, somehow bring into new ideas that generalize to a lot of different problems. So the first one is, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I ignore the earlier works of um, Bonner and Smith where they did the local well postness for S bigger than, uh, I think S bigger than three over two, S bigger than three over two, that's Bonner and Smith, but I ignore that. So I start with Kenning, Ponce and Vega where they prove the local well postness uh, for S bigger than three over four. And this is where they use the local a local smoothing estimate. And uh, S bigger than three over four includes the S equal to one. So that tells you that at uh, H, with H1 data uh, with, and with the help of conservation law, uh, you have global well postness. And Bergen did the local well postness for S equal to zero, where he introduced the XSB space. And then with the help of the conservation law, the conservation of mass, you also get global well postness uh, with L2 data. Uh, and then, uh, the important threshold comes uh, in 1996, where Kenning, Ponce, and Vega, they proved the local well postness for S bigger than negative three over four. Oh, I want to point out that uh, there's a scaling critical space, which is S equal to negative three over two. And I should have a dot here because otherwise uh, it's not a scaling invariant. 
So the scaling is S equal to negative three over two. So in uh, Kenning Pons Vega, they did S equal to negative three over four, and they come up with this uh, bilinear estimate, which in their paper, they explain that there's a um, similarity to the null uh, structure estimate of Kahneman and Markdown. Okay, and then this become an important threshold, uh, and uh, uh, the I team, Colander, Kio, Staflani, Takoka, and Tao, they put the global well postness uh, for S bigger than three over four, and their main work is to do the almost conservation well. In some sense, uh, the work of Kenning Pons Vega says that I can show local well postness up to time t, where the t depend on the HS. Oh, actually, uh, with or without dot, it's, uh, it's uh, crit at critical space, you have dot. Otherwise, you, have, you don't need to have dot. So uh, they show that there's the existence of time. The time depends on the, uh, the U0, the HS norm. And uh, the almost conception law tells you that this, even though the HS norm of the solution uh, is growing, but you can show that it's not growing too fast so that you can glue the solution uh, from piece to piece together up to infinity. So that's an uh, uh, important new idea. And then uh, Coleander, Kristen, and Tao, they showed that this negative three over four is in some sense a threshold. Uh, they showed the local well postness for a negative three over four. And then they also showed weak U postness. It's important that we have weak uh, U postness. What do I mean by weak? It means that uh, uniform dependence on data fails, which means that you cannot use fixed point argument. When, once you use fixed point argument or contraction mapping, you get uh, uh, uniform dependence on data, but then this one you don't. Okay, so it basically tells you this method fails. And then Guo and Kishimoto show the global well postness at the, this uh, sort of endpoint as equal to negative uh, three or four. This Guo is Guo Zihua, uh, negative three or four, where they refine the work of uh, 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 Kenning Pons Vega, they use a different resolution space and then combined with uh, combined with the almost conservation law of uh, of uh, the I team, they could prove global well postings. So this creates one of the uh, interesting uh, uh, threshold uh, tells you that if you look for uniform dependence on, on data, then this is the end of the story. But it's not the whole story because when you want to seek for well postings, there's no a reason to expect such a strong uh, well postness. So you can ask what happens if you relax, you want it to be well posed in the sense that it depends continuous on the data, not uniform continuous. Okay, so all the previous result we listed, it did not really use integrability. And so this method usually apply to a wider class of equations like um, other KDV equations, the KDV-like equations or you know, as in high dimension. But uh, we, as we said, there's a special structure, which is the integrable structure. It has to come into play um, uh, when you are doing uh, the sharp result. So in particular, there's a result of Kepler and Teploff. Uh, they showed on the, in a periodic case, uh, you have global well postness for H minus one data. And Monai uh, showed that the minus one becomes the real threshold in the sense that uh, you have strong your post needs for S less than negative one. So in the sense that the solution flow is just not continuous, no matter what space you are taking, it's not continuous. Um, and then uh, in 2018, there are two groups which they were able to do a low regularity conservation law in the sense that they construct a quantity, then we call it alpha t. And they ask this alpha t is conserved and this alpha t is a, is a uh, equivalent to the HS norm for S between negative one and zero. So this, uh, so uh, uh, they are essentially using the same method, but uh, yeah, the, the, and the result is the same. Yeah, so they proved, so this explains why the I team have this, um, why the I team have this almost a conservation law. In fact, uh, you have conservation law. You have low regularity conservation law. It's just that at that time, people don't know. It just at that time, people don't know. And then it comes with the, uh, this uh, important result of Kitty Fubishai in 2019. They showed the global well postness for S bigger or equal to negative one uh, using their new method called the regularized flow or approximate flow. And then this end uh, the whole discussion because of the result of Mona I showed that this is sharp. Okay. So uh, so this gives one of the backgrounds uh, for, for the KDV. And then now I want to uh, illustrate uh, what is KDV hierarchy. 
Okay, so um, so as I said, the lex operator, the spectrum information is important. So let's solve the eigenvalue problem in the sense that, okay, I solve L phi equal to Z square phi for imaginary part of Z bigger than zero. And then if you think about the U, if you think about the U as the Schwarz function or C zero infinity function, then at infinity U decays. So at spatial infinity, this becomes a simple ODE. It becomes a, a simple ODE, right? And so at infinity, you will have the solution equal to e to the i z x and plus minus i z x. So uh, this naturally uh, motivates us to look at the solutions to to this uh, at, because now you have a u at finite region. So then the solution asymptotically should behave like e to the i z x, but uh, at finite region it is not. So you are looking at uh, a real solution. Uh, um, we call it the Yost function uh, such that it behaves at the e to the i z x at one end, either at positive infinity or at negative infinity. So, so at uh, negative infinity, if it behaves like e to the minus i z x, I will call it left Yost function. Uh, otherwise, if at the other end, I will call it the right Yost function. So you're looking at two solutions uh, uh, which behaves like the linear one, which behaves like the, like, like the simple one. And um, so, now we think of now we think of phi l would characterize or would in, inherit this spectral information, and uh, then if you look at it at one end, behave like e to the minus i z x, which tells you as negative infinity decays, and then you look at it what its behavior at positive infinity, right? So clearly at two ends it cannot always be the same, right? It cannot always be the e to the i z x, right? So that's not possible, right? So there must be a shift. And then this will uh, uh, give it a notation called TZ. And this is the terminology that was used in this community called transmission coefficient. So you pass the information from negative infinity to positive infinity. And okay, so if you, if you heuristically think L, uh, so L, uh, uh, phi L would will, will in, uh, encode this uh, spectral information, then you should also think of TZ that it will encode the uh, spectral information and hence formally TZ should be conserved. And you can also prove that TZ is actually conserved uh, by uh, standard ODE problem uh, technique. So TZ will be conserved along the KDB flow. And uh, I think it was uh, uh, Fadeyev because I, I saw uh, this was uh, cited uh, by. Sorry, Jill I have a question. Yes. On the previous slide, uh, when you mentioned also that you can define uh, the right just function. Yes. And then you say that this dz uh, can be written like this, but what is uh, the w? W is the wrong skin. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I didn't explain, but yeah, thanks for I, I should put the notation. Yes. So it's the wrong skin. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it was Fadeyev who uh, gave a uh, asymptotic expansion of log uh, TZ. So TZ, we think of it as uh, uh, the expansion in terms of Z. And then uh, if you believe that uh, TZ will be conserved on the flow, and then each of the coefficients should be conserved along the flow. And hence, uh, you will just do expansion of, uh, in terms of Z, and then these ones, and this h would involve the function of u, right? So this will be involved function of u, h j function of a, function of u, and then you can you can do the computation. And um, so this this was already known a long time ago uh, that then this coefficient exactly are the conserved quantity that we just list uh, previously. So it, it gives you the integral of u and mass and Hamiltonian and uh, higher order Hamiltonian. Okay. So th th this is uh, one of the ingredients I need. And the next thing is, so now let's think of, um, now let's think of the uh, uh, KDB equation as uh, Hamiltonian flow. And so for that, I'm going to equip uh, the space of smooth functions uh, with uh, uh, a Poisson structure. A Poisson structure is this Poisson bracket uh, which is defined by the, uh, this is the fresh derivative of F. So F U and the fresh derivative of G uh, with the uh, extra derivative. And uh, so this is the Poisson bracket. And then you can define 
uh, the equation given any Hamiltonian H, you can define the equation uh, to be ut equal to partial x uh, of, of the fresh derivative. And how does this relate to the Poisson structure? So there's another way to write this as u and h. Well, this h is uh, um, uh, the Hamiltonian, but this u, we have to explain what it means because naively, this is um, uh, all, all this are the uh, giving a u, uh, h is mapping u to a number, right? So, so now what, what I, when I write this as person, uh, in terms of this person bracket, this u means I give u evaluated to u, y, to eva evaluation. So in this sense, I can, I can uh, talk about the Poisson uh, bracket. So this is another way to, to write the equation. So now, if I take, uh, if I take this KDV1, if I take this KDV1, I will get the KDV equation. And then there's a natural way to, uh, to extend this is to look at uh, all these uh, higher order uh, Hamiltonians which if you use h equal to the kdvj uh, and then plug in the same for, uh, form, uh, formulation of the equation, um, you will get uh, the so-called the kdv hierarchy. So this is what I'm going to study. And then you see that the kdv hierarchy is, uh, uh, so the first one is the third order. So that's the standard kdv. The next one, the u to the power four means four derivatives. Uh, and then this u2 means u2 means two derivatives. So, <coughs> so really, this next one is the fifth order KDV. The next one is the seventh order KDV. But it's more rigid in the sense that, um, so even though for KDV the numbers uh, the six the six can be like minus six or can be other numbers. Uh, once you do a scaling, it works. But then for high orders, I think it's more rigid what numbers you are putting here. You, there might be room to change it, but it's better to, 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 to be careful. And also, and also exactly to which terms, for example, uh, for example, this one have uh, in total three derivatives and two copy, this is a U, U, U2. And then this is uh, U1 to a sister. So it's also two copy of U, two derivatives, but then there are only these two, um, uh, uh, exist. But then, for example, for this one, this is the u u to the power four. This is the u one and u three. So there are other combinations. And then the question is, do they all appear? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. So, but the point is that um, so you might be able to write down other equations look like it by changing the coefficient or by changing uh, some of the terms. Uh, I will keep the scaling, but uh, it's very easy that you are going to break the integrability. So it's more rigid the equations. And the KDV hierarchy is a system of integrable equations also, and they all have the same scaling. So the critical space is also negative three over two. And there were not so many uh, uh, works uh, on, on this one. So the ones I found uh, are, for example, the ground rocks work shows that the KDV is locally well posed in this Fourier big space. But if we take the naive one, if we take R equal to two, this becomes our standard HS. So you will see what it in fact shows that is for higher order KDV with, with increasing regularity. So notice S is bigger than 2J minus two. With increasing regularity, you have local well postness. And then um, uh, Song Si Kong, uh, he's a student of Tao. So he showed the general fifth order KDV is locally well post for S bigger than uh, or you could do five or two. So when, when I say general, which means that he, he could uh, uh, change the coefficient and change the nonlinearity, but the, keep the scaling the same. And it shows that it's locally well posed for as bigger than five over two. And what is uh, remarkable is that it showed uh, the general fifth order KDV, the uniform dependence fail on any any s bigger than zero, which means for any problem, you cannot use fixed point argument. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. And then uh, Kennedy and Pillard and Gork and uh, Combe, they showed uh, the fifth order KDV is globally well posed for s equal to two. And this is the natural energy space. And they use, uh, they did it for the general fifth order KDV. So they did not really use integrability. 
Okay. And then for the periodical case, Kepler and Monod, they showed the fifth order KDV is global well post for S equal to zero and the strongly ill post for S less than zero, for S less than zero. So it's interesting, you will see that the uh, periodical case and the case on the line uh, start to bifurcate since the uh, start starting from the fifth order KDV. And then recently, Brinkman, Kilman, Vishayan, they showed that the fifth order KDV is global well post uh, on the line for data in H minus one. So, so it's, it's important that uh, you notice on the periodical case it's L2 and on the line it's H minus one. But for KDV, they are the same. The sharp result is, uh, is both H, H minus one. Okay, so what uh, we proved is that we are going to do it for the whole hierarchy. Uh, so the theorem uh, looks a little bit nasty. So let me try to explain a little bit. Um, so let me uh, try to write, uh, this is the local smoothing norm. This is the local smoothing norm. It tells you that if I localize uh, in a special region, I will have an extra derivatives. I will have an extra regularity. So what we proved is that uh, if you take uh, u0, no, so let me read the final result. If you take u0 in h minus one, and then you will have a unique solution uh, in this uh, space, which is uh, naturally continuous to H minus one and uh, local smoothing and local smoothing space. And moreover, we, we prove the local smoothing, the cut smoothing estimate holds, which tells you that uh, it has extra regularity and also it is controlled by the size of the image data in H minus one norm. Okay. Okay, so uh, in, in fact, if you see that n equal to one and two was already obtained by Kilman Vishan and Kilman Vishan Brimman, and uh, uh, but the paper of the fifth order KDV was much more complicated, which I will uh, explain at the end. Uh, and we try to give a more unified approach for higher order equations. And in fact, if you read their paper, they say, okay, so it's um, it become algebraically difficult to do the, the next one. And also as a byproduct, which you, I didn't I I'm, I didn't state here that we also obtain unconditional uniqueness for the solutions uh, with data in L two, well, one regularity higher than the sharp one. And so we believe the result is sharp. So it says that it's a, it's a belief, but we did not um, uh, prove. And uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it's expected that the the um, uh, the proof of Mona should carry over, but uh, we haven't checked it because the nonlinearity is getting nastier and nastier. It's not like the one simple equation. Um, and then on the torus case, the KDV hierarchy should have increasing sharp regularity. So in a sense that if you, you're considering the torus or the periodic case, uh, you should have KDV is the well posed at H minus one, fifth order KDV at L2, seventh order at H1, and so on and so forth. And so the key difference is, uh, is exactly the smoothing effect. So on the line, you have smoothing, but on the torus, you don't have. So that's, uh, that's the difference. So this is something that um, we, are, uh, we are writing up. So that's why the paper is taking longer and longer because we want to get it uh, complete. Okay, so we basically follow the new idea of KDB shine of this approximate flow, but we are going to do it uh, uh, not for KDB equation or for KDB hierarchy. We are going to do it for another equation. And I will show you the benefit. The benefit is that we are going to, the way we do it, the first is that we have a unified approach. And second, it looks slightly easier. Uh, it looks slightly easier. Okay. So uh, uh, let's give a very long introduction for uh, for the background. And now let me try to tell you, because I said there's a gardener. What do I mean by gardener? I'm going to explain next. So uh, there's uh, this important mirror map, which is uh, you, did, you take a function of V, you define it as Vx plus V square. So it connects the MKDV equation to the KDV equation. So in particular, if you take a MKDV equation and this is the KDV equation, you take a solution here and you apply the Mura map, this will give you a solution to the KDV equation. So this is a nonlinear transformation. And um, so in some sense, that tells you heuristically, if you ignore the second term, it means V equal to U equal to VX. So in some sense, if you are proving something HS here, it corresponds to prove something HS minus one here, right? So these two are related. 
Well, if this map is invertible, then these two problem would be equivalent. So solving it at one, you know, one side is enough. But unfortunately, this is not invertible. This is not invertible. But you will see a lot of result of this type. For example, you will see there's a lot of work by Peter Perry and his collaborators where they were, what they, they did is to take initial data that is on a range of Mura map. So on a range, Mura L2 data. You take L2 data and you take the Mura map. So that means it's a subset of H minus one. So if I take this as initial data, I can prove uh, global well postings. Oh, oh, I, oh, I need to check it's global or local well posting, but, but the well postness, I think at least the local well postness. So, so uh, but that's not the whole uh, story, right? That's not all the data. So, so the point is that it's not invertible. So what we, we want to do is we want to invert Mura map, well, but it's not invertible. So we already know it's impossible. So how are we going to do it? So what we do is that uh, we carefully analyze what does it mean to say U is in the range of the Mura map? If U is in the range, then this lax operator is actually factorizable into partial X plus V and minus partial X plus V. So then it is a positive semi-definite. It is positive uh, semi-definite. So that means you have L phi phi, which equal to partial X plus V phi to square so it's positive semi-definite okay and uh, so now what we want is if you take a data that is in h minus one we want to make this operator positive semi-definite it's not right but you can add a very very large number you find a very very large number tau zero which depend on h minus one norm of u so that this one is positive semi-definite and in that sense, that tells you u plus tau zero square is in the range of Mura. So u plus tau zero square must have a pre-image. And then you can show that this pre-image uh, at uh, infinity is uh, asymptotic behavior at tau, at tau zero. So you can write at v equal to w plus tau zero. So then this w would be in a natural sublet space. And then you can relate u and w in the sense that u equal to wx plus two w square plus two tau zero w. This is what we call modified mirror map. And I, I think someone also called it Gardner map when, when I was giving a talk. Someone said it's called Gardner map. I did not find the right reference. Okay, so, and then this map is invertible. So this map is invertible. So that is uh, our, uh, one of our key uh, ingredient is that we are not going to invert the Mura map, but we're going to invert this modified Mura map. And then this relates to the equation if W, uh, if W solves the Gardner equation, if you look at it, it behaves like uh, one part is MKDV, one part of nonlinearity is KDV. So it's a mix of KDV and MKDV. So if W solves the a Gardner equation, then you solve the KDB equation, you solve the KDB equation. And then this map is invertible. So that's important. Okay. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. So even though I'm going to provide the uh, slides to you, but I, I, I cheat a little bit. So uh, there is a, a, a different way to define the equation. One way is to you write the equation, uh, you write the equation and then you directly plug in. Uh, you, you directly plug in u equal to wx plus w square plus total zero w, and then that will give you a Gardner equation. There's another way to write it uh, is you, you look at the Hamiltonian, the KDB Hamiltonian, and you plug in u equal to uh, wx plus w square plus total zero w. That will give you a different Hamiltonian, and then this Hamiltonian will generate a new equation. So these two are not exactly the same the two will differ by some lower order terms. So I will cheat a little bit pretending that these two are the same. So that's, uh, that's uh, just, to make the, the, just to make the talk easier. Okay, so that means our goal is to solve the Gardner hierarchy. So I'm going to uh, transfer the KDB hierarchy to Gardner hierarchy, transfer the H minus one problem to the L2 problem, to the L2 data problem. Okay, and so then we, in some sense, uh, so this will be uh, our main theorem. Our main theorem will be say that take data in L2, the Gardner uh, so the equation, Gardner hierarchy will have a solution. Uh, 
uh, which is continuous with respect to time and with respect to data. Okay, so now we will we will uh, show the uh, explain the idea of critical machine and then we will apply it to the Gardner equation. So what is the uh, the idea of kid animation. So, okay, so what he did is that, uh, remember we already have the expansion of the transmission coefficient into the Hamiltonians. Now he did a truncation. So he truncated from here, truncated from here, and truncated from here. So in some sense, I'm going to solve, uh, I'm going to multiply 2k to the power five and uh, subtract everything. So I get a new Hamiltonian. I get a new Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian is very similar to, is approaching the KDB Hamiltonian in the sense that if K goes to infinity, clearly uh, HK will, so HK will goes to HKDB. KDB at K goes to infinity. So that's uh, very clear. Okay, so, and then the hope is that this Hamiltonian flow will provide a good approximation for the KDB flow. Well, uh, so this is the standard uh, procedure that um, uh, they first started, is to first show that uh, KDV equation is local well posed for nice data, for sure data. And then, um, in fact, not uh, just, just good high regularity data is good enough. And then is to show that the HK flow will be well posed uh, at H minus one, and this HK flow is it's um, it's very easy to prove prove because it's a good uh, approximation. It can be viewed as a, as a low frequency approximation. And so so then this is just proved by standard OD uh, technique or like Picard iteration. So fairly easy. And then the difference or the difficulty is to prove that the solution of the KDV equation and the solution of the HK flow converge to each other as K goes to infinity. And the normally, if you want to compare two solutions to two different equations, you're gonna subtract the equation and then it becomes very messy. But the point is that all these flows are commute. So showing that the flow commute, the, the difference of the, in order to understand the difference of the solution, it's the same as understand the difference of the flow. Okay, so, and then this, wait, I think uh, that's exactly, I uh, had one line. Yes, so, so showing the difference of the, showing the, the solutions converge is the same as showing that the, the difference Hamiltonian will generate a solution, will generate a flow, is to show that the, the difference flow converge to zero. Okay, so then uh, we are going to do it exactly for our Gardner problem in the sense that, okay, we write down the Lex pair. So for Gardner equation, it is uh, a matrix form. This is very similar to MKDV because if you write the Lex pair for MKDV, it's a, it's a matrix. And then you do the same thing. You talk about the left Yost function and you talk about the transmission coefficient and you do a expansion for this uh, transmission coefficient. Um, and then you will do a truncation. So it's the same, so it's the same procedure. Okay, so uh, a slightly more technical problem is that we are going to define alpha equal to this uh, uh, logarithmic, logarithmic of the transmission coefficient, uh, subtract this term. Because this term, it's uh, naively, you need the uh, W to be in L1 to be, to, to be well defined. But uh, if you uh, subtract this two, you can show that uh, for, for HS data, it's actually well defined. Okay, and then we will follow their technique in the sense that we'll do the approximation flow. So we do the truncation, the first truncation, and as K goes to infinity, it approximates the first Hamiltonian. And uh, you do the second truncation, it approximates the second Hamiltonian. But it's interesting to notice that the second truncation can be written as a difference of the first truncation and the real Hamiltonian. So, uh, if in practice, what we do is we prove by induction. We prove by, by induction. So what we do is that we first show that the first, uh, uh, we first show that uh, uh, the first Gardner equation is well posed, and the first approximate flow is well posed, and they approach each other. And then you take the you take the difference that tells you that the second 
Sorry, I, I didn't. So you, so you take the difference that tells you the second approximate flow is well posed. And then you show the second approximate flow is converging to the second one. And then they take, a, they take a difference. You will get the third approximate flow is well posed. And then you show the third approximate flow is converging to the uh, third real flow. So that's the, the whole argument. You do it inductively. But in that, our, we have the good induction base because induction base is the first uh, KDV is well posed. And that's the work of KDV Michel. That's the work of KDV Michel. OK. So, and then let's quickly uh, uh, explain uh, how this, uh, the, the key part is, wor uh, is worked out. The key part is to show that the difference of the solution uh, will, approach, will approach each other. But let's start from the beginning. So if, you, if I take L2 data, if I take L2 data, and then I can take nice data, like Schwarz data to, to approach it. And then the nice data will generate the nicest solutions to the Gardner equation. And they will also generate the solutions to the approximate flow. Okay, so what is our goal? Our goal is to show that the solution UN, the solution UN will have a limit, right? Our point is to show the solution UN has a limit. Well, we will first show that it converges weakly in the sense that you take a test function. And then you, uh, you, com you compare the difference of UN with UM. Well, these are the real solutions. These are the solutions to the Gardner uh, flow. And then I'm going to subtract, uh, compare it with the different, with the approximate flow. So these this two are the same, right? You compare the Gardner flow with the approximate flow, the Gardner flow with the approximate flow. And then the third term is that you compare the, uh, the approximate flow for two different data, right? And then the third one is, is nice. The third one is nice, so, so it can be smaller than epsilon because the approximate flow is nice. Uh, so with, uh, and then uh, the, the local theory or the well posting theory is good enough. And so the difference is to show that, uh, as what I said, is to show that the, the Gardner solution and the approximate solution are converging to each other, but we're only doing it for weak convergence because you pair it with a test function. Okay, so so then the main point to show this two is less than epsilon, right? So show that they convert. Okay, and how do you show that the difference of these two uh, are the, uh, uh, are converging to each other? So we will do it um, to write it as so. So this notation is a little bit uh, annoying. So this means I'm going to take the data and solve it with the Gardner. This means I'm going to take the data and solve it along the approximate flow. But because all these Hamiltonians are commuting and all these flows are commuting, so it, in fact, you can write it as uh, taking, uh, taking our data uh, along the Gardner flow to time t and then along the difference flow, along the difference flow. So this is the hk minus hk. The, 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 the difference Hamiltonian will generate the difference flow. OK, so that means we want to understand the difference flow, which is the solution of this type. So the, the solution to the difference, the difference Hamiltonian will generate the difference flow. So we want to understand un minus unk at time t is corresponding to the wt minus w0, right? So then I'm going to just write it as the, the integration after t time t derivative. And then for this one, you are going to use the equation. You're going to use the equation. So you can write and then put, um, because this is partial TW, is this is partial X delta, delta W and the difference Hamiltonian. So, and then you can put this derivative back to phi. So what you get is phi derivative uh, times uh, the fresh derivative of the difference Hamiltonian. And you want to show that this part converged to zero as uh, uh, the parameter k goes to infinity. And uh, so this is our goal. And then we'll see why this um, is not so hard for our Gardner problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll put this to the end. I'll, I'll explain this to the end. So, but suppose we already show, suppose we already show that the weak convergence holds. And then you want to upgrade the strong convergence, right? You want to upgrade the strong convergence. And for this, you need some pre-compactness property, which means that 
Um, so if you have a set of data, we, we just did do it for L2, right? For, for KDB problem, they did it for H minus one, which is a more or slightly more difficult problem uh, technically. So a set is called pre-compact uh, if uh, it's equicontinuous and tight. By equicontinuous, we mean that uh, for all the functions in this set Q, uh, the, the difference h, as the difference h goes to zero, their norm goes to zero. And the tight means that they're uniformly small. So let me draw this picture. Means that you are looking at a large region R and you look at the outside this R. You, it means outside this region, they are uniformly small. So this is, this is what tight means. And then you can argue by contradiction. You argue by contradiction to show that uh, uh, if a set is compact, if a set is pre-compact, then weak convergence would imply strong convergence. And this is uh, uh, not hard. You just do a suppose not and then uh, pick the limit, pick the subsequence that have a limit and pick the test function such that uh, uh, it pair up with the limit is not zero. So this is a fairly simple uh, argument. Okay, so now let's summarize our task. This is close to the end of my talk, uh, so I'm going to be, uh, be a little bit quick. So let's summarize the task. So first of all, we need to show equicontinuity. Equicontinuity uh, here it means um, uh, here it means uh, well we, we have the formula here, right? But uh, uh, wait, uh, but uh, Kevin and Vishen in their work uh, they showed that uh, this is uh, basically. Um, equivalent to show that the W psi, th this quantity, it's equivalent to show that this quantity goes to zero. Uh, but then this is not too hard because the quantity alpha that we, con we construct, alpha is conserved, alpha is this one. Alpha is this one, alpha is this one. Alpha is conserved and moreover alpha is, uh, wait, sorry, I have a problem with flick. So alpha is approximately exactly this quantity because I square uh, W square and because I square plus four times square. So alpha is approximately this one and then this one is conserved, right? So, and then because alpha is conserved and then you can immediately compute, you can compute what it is. You can, you can imme immediately compute. So basically the equicontinuity is not a difficult problem. It follows simply from the conservation law, low regularity conservation law. So the, diffi so, so the difficult problem is the tightness. The difficult problem is tightness. Let me see. Wait, sorry, I have a problem with flipping the page. Okay. So, and what tightness? Tightness means that uh, because what is the set Q we are taking? We are going to take the set Q means that we are going to take this data. We are going to take this data and the Q will be exactly this E to the TJ Nabla HJ. So take the Q is exactly all the solutions. Q will be exactly the solutions. Okay, so what we want to say is that if the data are small uh, outside the large region, then we can find a different one. We can find a different uh, R so that the solution is uniformly small. So that the solution is uniformly small. And so, oh, oh, actually I write it here. So this Q, what we take is exactly, you take all this data and then evolve it up to time one and evolve it up to time one. Okay, uh, so here I write down an estimate which I call local smoothing. This you can think of it as um, uh, to do it for MKDV or to do it for Ghana, it's the same. So if you think of an MKDV equation, Okay, up to constant, okay. Okay, so what we do is we are gonna just do integral parts. So, so that's, the, that's the good thing about using Gardner equation. Uh, so uh, smoothing is basically integral parts. So I take, I, I take this, um, basically I, on the two sides of the equation, I'm going to I multiply by, by W and take, a, uh, uh, take uh, integral. So which means that I'm gonna take uh, the W square uh, multiply with some, uh, you can think of it a test function, but uh, we are going to choose this eta later. 
Okay, so you just simply plug in the equation and then you will get a, you will get a um, formula of this type. And notice that here we already have, here we already have Wx square, right? So this Wx square is because our main term is a three order derivative. And if you even out the derivative, you will get, uh, so Wx square. So what this means, let's see, what, what this quantity means, it means eta w square at time t is equal to eta w square at time zero plus all this double derivative t and x, right? All this double derivative. And then let's look at the, all these ones. Okay, so this term uh, is basically L2 norm if you throw away eta. So it's bounded by L2 norm. L2 norm is conserved. And this is also bounded by L2 norm. And then this W3 will be bounded by these two terms, Wx and W4. So you can basically throw it away, right? So that tells you, let's move this to the left. So you get eta x, Wx squared plus W to the power fourth. This is the W integration. Okay, so basically it tells you that you have an estimate of this type. So it have two effects. The first one is that you have local smoothing. You have Wx squared plus W to the power four, to the power four time with this eta derivative. Uh, locally, it is bounded by initial data in L2 norm, right? So this tells you this eta, you think of it as a bump function. Eta x, you think of it as a bump function. So then this tells you that locally in space, the solution is having one more regularity than the data. So this is the local smoothing estimate. So immediately, as I said, you take you take eta to be you take eta to be the uh, bump function of this type, and then its derivative is exactly is, is like a lo, uh, localized solution. Okay, but there are other choice, but there are other choice that can help you to get tightness. For example, if you, if you take this choice of eta, this choice of eta means that I'm gonna take the same thing, but it is moving, but it is moving uh, because you have x minus r squared minus tau squared t, so it is moving. So, and then we look at this term. This tells you eta w square at time t is bounded by the initial data in L2. And moreover, this eta is, uh, is a truncation. So it's basically a bump to the right. And we have tightness, right? The data is tight. So which means this part is small because x is bigger than r, right? So uh, this part is small. So this tells you the solution will also have tightness. So the solution will also have tightness. So if you take data to be small uh, outside R, and then the solution will have R plus T square. Oh, sorry, tau T square. So the if the data is small outside this region, and then the solution will be small outside R plus tau T square. So that tells you tightness to the right. And then you have another choice is you flip the sum you change the choice of the function to be of this type. So it's one minus hyperbolic tangent. So this characterizes the tightness to the left, but the sign is different because you notice now eta derivative is negative. So this term, so this term minus eta derivative is something positive. You cannot move it to the left. You cannot move it to the left. Okay, so this at first, uh, uh, for the first look, you think of, oh, so this will create a problem. But in fact, it's not because this eta x, double x plus double four, it's another, it's simply a bump, right? It's a, it's a local smoothing norm uh, localized in some region. So we can choose this one. We can choose this localization large enough because the center, you can choose it at any point. So you can choose it large enough to cover this term, to cover this estimate. And then this will give you tightness to the left. It tells you that if your initial data is tight, it's uniformly small to the left, and then the solution is also uniformly small to the left. So for this way, by this way, we prove tightness to the left. So, we, so that tells you we finished two jobs, the tightness and the equicontinuity. Okay, so this is my last slide. And this slide is really hand waving because uh, I said the key, uh, the next key is to understand the difference flow. 
So to understand the different flow in the work of Kitty Bevisha and Brinkman, they tried very hard to understand exactly the difference Hamiltonian and uh, to you compare each term and to say uh, what is their subtle cancellation. Um, but because we have well, the whole hierarchy, it's very hard to find out the whole cancellation. So there's the work of Koko and Nataru in their low regularity conservation law. They did a different expansion of this uh, logarithmic of uh, the transmission coefficient. Because previously we did the expansion in terms of this Z or IK or I tau, whatever notation you use it. But what they did is the, trans uh, is the expansion in terms of how many copy of U. So what, what you're doing is that you collect all the terms involve U square, uh, two copy of U. Oh, so quadratic, cubic, and uh, four copy of U. You, you do an expansion of U. You do an expansion of U. And if you do an expansion of U, the point is that in order to do this cancellation, really you don't need to do it like for all terms. You only need to do it for the leading term. Because if you think about it, the Hamiltonian, what is the one that involves the highest order derivative? It's a quadratic term. It's a quadratic term, right? So really that means if you want to do, find the cancellation, uh, you can do it in the sense that you just need to find the cancellation for the first few terms. For, if you do multi-linear expansion, only the first few terms that you need to do it very carefully to find the cancellation. And all the other later terms, uh, you can just treat it as error terms. So, and, and I think that's the key. And when I say cancellation, what exactly do I mean by cancellation? So if you think about it, so the Gardner hierarchy or the Gardner equation, it will, for example, if you think of the Gardner, so it will have smoothing of order one, right? And if you have the approximate flow, it will also have smoothing of one. <laughs> But the point is to say that their difference have more smoothing. So this is really what I mean by subtle cancellation because this cancellation will tell you you have more smoothing. But what do I mean by more smoothing is that this smoothing will depend on the parameter kappa or the parameter tau. So that when you let, you will have this effect. So you will have an effect that when you have tau, when you have this kappa or when you have this, uh, this parameter kappa or tau, whatever you, it, you name it, when you have this one goes to zero, this, even though you have smoothing estimate and this estimate will depend on this parameter. And if you let this one goes to zero, uh, goes to infinity, then this uh, smoothing estimate will give you zero. So this is uh, what I really mean by the cancellation. So this is, uh, in our mind, uh, this is, um, uh, it's not a new idea because it's from Koch and Tataru, but it, it should be the new input to help improve uh, or to extend the work of Kilby Shine to the whole hierarchy. Yeah. So, but I wave hand a little bit because I don't want to write down this uh, expansion. Uh, it, it's too complicated. Yeah. But anyway, so that's all for my talk and thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I, I just uh, a quick question before uh, in the previous slides, I, I still cannot get the point of this uh, uh, bump function of this. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mean this one? Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one. So, so how you control it? So, so the, the way is that if you look at it, so this means you're estimating it to a bump. So because this derivative is a hyperbolic second, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> So that means I'm going to, I need to estimate on the bump center at minus r minus tau square t mm -hmm. and the bump. But then I'm doing it up to time one, right? So this bump is moving, how much time it is moving? So it's up to oh, time okay. one. I see. So it's a small bump, small bump, small bump, but then I'm going to find a very large bump to cover all of uh -huh, it. Uh -huh. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, okay. So what, what if this is for the global in time, then yeah, then it cannot but, work. But then you, you, you because you're you can do it on zero one and then you can just naively oh, okay. It. I see. Uh, I see. Yes. All right. Because we will have this consumption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, right, right. Okay. So thank you. Uh, are there any questions?
Okay, uh, maybe I, I can start with another question about okay. this uh, hierarchy. So uh, yes. when you, uh, 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 so is there any background for this uh, expansion of this, uh, in, in, of this log T? Oh, so uh, I, I'm not so familiar with this one. So uh, I think this is a very good question, but I, I don't think I have a, 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 a good understanding of, of this. So uh, I think even in the work of Kili they only cite uh, Fadiev says Fadiev is the first one to, to do this. But I, so I talked to uh, people who, uh, who says that, uh, who work on integrability, and uh, so it seems that this whole hierarchy thing is in some sense the key to, how do I say, for example, you talk to uh, Fanosh in our department, he says, oh, this is related to the cell written theory. So, so it seems that all these things have a uh, very strong motivation for them, but I, I, I'm not an expert on this direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so simple mm -hmm. answers, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, no problem, no problem. So, uh, so what if, if we uh, uh, expand this T, now the T actually is, uh, has two variables, one is Z and another one is U. So what yes. if we expand this uh, in both variables, regard it as a multivariable function. So you see the this one, they expand in Z and the later you also introduce that uh, Kenig, oh sorry, yes. Taharu and the uh, Coach, they expand in U. So what if we yes. expand in both, then what kind of a structure we will have? Um, so in some sense, for example, here, we already did the expansion in terms of U, right? Yes. And then, um, so it's a more like a fixed tau and then you expand the U. And uh, in the previous, yes. you fix U and expand this Z or I tau. Uh, what if you expand the both? Look at it, regard it as a, it's a multivariable. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, so, so in fact, so in fact, uh, for uh, for for these ones, you can also do do, do expansion. But the question is, um, uh, then there's mixture of um, different terms. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not entirely sure what to uh, like. What good uh, uh, expression to expect? Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, this may be related to the, uh, I mean, it may relate to the, my first question. So what, yes, what, yes. what do they do for this expansion? I mean, the hierarchy, what, what, what are they, what's the purpose of this? Yeah, maybe it's not, um, it's not that clear. Right, it's not that, uh, that clear. So, so for this, I know you can do expansion. For this, clearly mm -hmm. you can do expansion. It's just mm -hmm. that you do expansion, so, Originally, we already collect, it's like you do two summations, right? I already collect mm -hmm. the, the submission, but then if you want to fully expand it out, uh, you can, but I, but I don't know what to, to, to expect or like uh, what, what good formulation to expect. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, never mind, no problem. Yeah, I'm not quite, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, so in fact, I'm also new to this uh, topic. And, and I think it's not only uh, since the Kilburn Mishan start to look at it, uh, because for a long time, the whole field is trying to look at a method that is independent of integrability so that you can oh. apply to wider problems. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. then it, it, it turns out that uh, yes, at least at this point, we don't have a good method to extend to to other mm -hmm. yeah. But this uh, this uh, approximate flow seems uh, very yes yes interesting yes. yeah right, 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 right. can be used other so places. it it can be think of it uh, as uh, so so I think uh, when I hear talks people are explaining that you think of now form transformation uh, normal form transformation is to try is to somehow transform the equation. From mm -hmm. bilinear to uh, to, to cubic to, to quadratic to cubic, mm -hmm. so this is also in some sense of a like a nonlinear transformation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you get that. Yeah, and uh, and uh, because you add this larger number tau zero and make it become invertible, right? So yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Uh, are there any questions?
Okay, so if not, let's thank Bao Ping again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the very nice uh, talk. Time and invitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay.